Hello everyone and welcome to Rocket Lasso Live Season 3 Episode 26. Gonna have to start thinking about wrapping up the season. Not in the next month or so, but getting around there. We're getting later in the year. Uh, if everything stands as it is currently, I will be speaking at NAB, which I think is happening in October. It's an in-person thing, so it'll be a giant multi-day live stream, of course, from Maxon. How is everyone doing today? I hope very well. Uh, I don't have any specific news to tackle today, so... <laughs> Sphere Factory says uh, you don't know why it's called Ricochet and not Noodles, which is amazing. Uh, Scott, Dean, Zach, Sphere Factory, of course. Animation Hamster, Eric, Mumpties, Ninja Cran, Peer... Uh, Jaspel, Mr. Matt Dog, Sid, Brawlius, people showing up every second. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing well. So, start getting those questions together. I guess without a bunch of news, I need those links quickly. Uh, Batson, welcome. Batson 3000. Nobody does uh, 2000 anymore. Do you remember 2000 was all the rage for a long time? And then as we got too close to 2000, it's like, wait, that's not futuristic anymore. Uh, burned, welcome. How is everybody doing today? Burned being here reminds me that I still have it open. I have a tab open in one of my web browsers where I have the everything that came out with Service Pack 1 for S24, and I never even got a chance to read through it um, and then forgot to go back. I got to check that out at some point and see if anything has any impact on anything that we're doing. Um, Sid's got a link for us. Let's see if that is indeed a link for us. Uh, Justin, welcome. Um, uh, Joel LX Bush, welcome. Uh, Kasim, welcome. Or is it Kasim? Sorry, apologies for, for pronunciations. Anyway, a uh, quick recap of the rules. Uh, if you post a link, make sure I can see the artist or studio who made it. Otherwise, it has to be a really abstracted question. And if it's a video, make sure you're calling out the specific effect or time code. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you can't post links, but feel free to type out a question or you can head over to Twitch. There's a link below to... I'll post links if you want to, but I like typed out questions. That covers all the basics. Uh, clicking the YouTube link and muting it. And let's see if it plays right away. Oh, that's cute. Okay, so pull that window out. And what do we got here? Well, it's... Oop, let me switch to the screen. Very important. Okay, so this is something real. I love real world stuff called Ramp Walker. So this has very few views and it's from... I think a Chinese channel, and there's no English here, so I unfortunately can't give much in the way of specific credit. So let's check out what we've got. We'll be, if we do tackle this, then we'll be transforming it quite a bit as we'll be changing the medium. I have seen this type of mechanism. It's real specific. Mechanically speaking, I think there's only one Oof. there's only one moving part. There's just, the, there's one joint, and we can even see where it is right here. But it's heavily dependent on a particular angle of balance. Like, everything needs to be perfectly weighted to work here. And the basic mechanism, you can see, I'm trying to see the specifics here, because the specifics matter. It looks like the back foot and the front foot are both kind of one continuous curve. It's hard to tell, but I think that might sort of look like a rocking chair foot underneath. So as it begins rocking, maybe there is a spring because it needs to it's not full screen. When it tips back, why? It's on the back foot. Let me just frame forward. If you don't know, you can use the greater than or less or the period and comma button to frame forward on YouTube, which is handy. So it's on the back foot. And as it tilts forward. Yeah, that's interesting. So it it stayed on the back foot and the front foot isn't collapsing onto it. Mm, mechanically speaking, that I'm not even sure how to do that. And it swings forward when it suddenly doesn't have any weight on it. Why would that be the case? Hmm. 
and then it rolls back and the front feet suddenly pop forward. Hmm. I'm worried that we could spend a decent amount of time on here and just not know mechanically what's going on inside. There's a slight worry with that. I'm gonna click on a different version, which is still muted, and see if there's any additional information. Cute. Unfortunately, no additional information. Passive dynamic walker. So here's a video from someone named Joe Polin. And presumably, well, hopefully, do, 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 nope. Actually, this is, okay, yeah, so he's got Lego versions that he is putting together. Crazy <laughs> simulations. Oh, okay, this looks like, it looks like there's not like a spring necessarily. Oh, but yeah, look how complicated it is for that to do its thing. Um, there's no clamps on that one, but anyway, it gives us enough information to be like, well, maybe there's something here. I'll tink. I will. Uh, I will. We'll tinker here and see if we can get anything working. Um, to begin with, I will create a floor and tilt that floor to about 25 degrees. 25 degrees actually seems like quite a bit. Like when it's like, oh, there's a 30 degree slope on a on a hill. It's always like that doesn't sound like too much. It's like that's a really steep hill. Um, so yeah, we'll do about 20 degrees, which mm, I'm going to go maybe overly steep just as a start point for us. Let's make a blocker. This is more of a visual for ourselves. Feed that into, I guess if I can make it a collider body, I might as well put it into a cloner. And I did make the, it a floor just because dynamically nothing can escape through. This will just be some little ramps to block it in. Uh, turn on a little bit of SSAO just to get things slightly placed on the ground. We'll be dealing with dynamics, so I will immediately save this file. Dynamic walker. Die. Dynamic walker. Okay, this is way too steep, even at a glance. Let's calm that down a bit. Let's go 15 degrees. And we're going to go 10. 10 seems closer to what we saw. Now, mechanically speaking, as I said, I feel like that was one continuous arc. We can keep this very simplistic. And then we, you know, I don't care about the visuals of the shape. All I care about is the mechanics of it, for now anyway. So, the thought is we need to make this large enough and then get a slice out of it. So we'll turn on slice and we only get that top part. And then we're going to use significantly less than. Let's just do that. And then make a duplicate of it. And that will go above and pure eyeballing right now. And then that one goes to 90. Okay. Uh, might as well make these exactly equivalent. So what is that number? I don't know. I'm just going to not make it exactly equivalent. We can eyeball it by doing that. So I'm looking at the arc from the grid. It seems to be fine. Um, okay. Those two have, let's go back to the more original reference. Yeah, so you see that's a fairly shallow arc on it. I'm not sure. And that's static for the main body. And then this probably is over the center of mass or very close to it. So uh, I went with cylinders, so I can't really chop out from the inside, but I don't think that has any bad effect. Okay, so make a cube. This will just be our visual connector. And then, yeah, for now, I'll just make another cube, and this is going to be the body of it. And 
then, okay, what do we got? We've got this shape, which should be a child of that. And then making a duplicate. And this will become a child of that. This one is the body. This one is back foot, front foot. Try and keep ourselves from getting confused. All right. This object, actually the front foot and the body are a single unit. So I will add a simulation, rigid body, and individual elements is actually going to be, you know, inherent object will be compound collision shape. So all of the, those are being treated as exactly one shape. And I'm just going to say moving mesh. So the whole thing is being treated as dynamic. And then we've got the back foot. Visually, that's going to be pivoting from, hold down seven as I move up. That's going to be pivoting from, I don't know, maybe this zeroed out point, not sure, but we can make that up as we go. So this will also be a compound collision shape. So I'll make it so, and the two get connected via, it's going to be top heavy right now, but right now they will get connected via a simulate connector that can move up to our approximate midpoint. I'm not sure, I'm just eyeballing. Put that as a child of the body, which I think is fine. And that needs, is it really small? Why can I not see it? Yeah, I guess this might be huge. Yeah, okay, so it's the correct orientation. So this will connect from A to B and that should be the majority of the basics of this rig. I'm going to leave everything, well, I guess we are going larger in the cube. So perhaps we can scale everything down. Just enough to put it in that track. Okay. That's the first thought. So moving the floor downward just to keep it clean. That's really tall right now. But let's just see what happens. It's probably going to tip completely over. Let's take another look at this. Like this is one piece that never moves from there. And that must pivot there. Yeah, that's all treated as one unit. That's only one moving part, and it clearly pivots from there. But that doesn't mean there's not some counterweight above it or additional details. Don't know. Um, now, visually, these are super colliding with each other, but that none of that matters. The mechanical connections we did are sound here. If I shrink those in, it'll look a little bit like less like they're colliding. So... Um, even at a glance, though, that, oh, that pivot point's on the center of mass of the overall shape. Let's take a look. Stop full screening. Center of mass, if that's the center of mass, it has temporarily moved over this foot. And that stays locked in. And now the center of mass is on the back foot. Hmm. Yep. Well, nothing to do but hit play. Oh, and put some dynamics tags on the ground. Simulation rigid body should be all that needs. That will filter down the children automatically. Wee. Oh, let's tell. Ooh. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, these are currently set to ignore collisions, which is fine. That's good. But these, I thought we could use the ignore collisions to our advantage here, but that doesn't work. So. Let's scoot that off to the side. And that's just the body. That needs to be put into a, let's put that into another cloner, which should be centered out at zero. And get to Get the spacing right. Okay, so now you can see that there's actually some spacing there. And then technically those feet should probably be skinnier. It doesn't really matter, but it'll visually look better. Fatten that up a bit. Make them closer together. There, now it's not actually colliding with it. And that will be put into a connect object, which I suppose can be put into a null. And we'll take that dynamics tag, move it up to the null. So now this is, entire thing is a collider body. But now the back foot doesn't physically com 
uh, collide with the body, which means this connector, we now say, don't ignore the collisions. Save, does it explode? No, but that connector is not, oh, now it's connected to body, but that's a subcomponent. So can we connect it to a null? I don't know. Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, it pivots off that back one, all right, and it hits this front foot. But now that front foot has, okay, okay, I kind of see what's mechanically going on here. Let's move this backward. The weight, oh, did I do that backwards? The weight, yeah, we want it to be heavier in the back. So I'm going to scoot that forward. So now when it tilts forward, hmm. I'm trying to get an, let's look at the reference again. And let's view it from the other side. He leans back, and by the nature of it leaning backward, the front feet automatically go up. And as soon as the weight is off the back, it suddenly catches up, but now it wants to tilt backward. Yeah, it wants to tilt backward. So we could just move a weight, a heavy weight around on the back instead of scooting this thing around constantly. So let's try doing that. Um, it shouldn't be difficult. All we do, I'll just make another cube and move it over onto the back end here. And that's just kind of a volume. And that should automatically be added in on the overall weight of it. So now that just makes the back end heavier. And it's probably too much now. So the front foot's caught up. No, I don't think it is too heavy. Don't slide, more friction. No bounce, lots of friction. Still sliding. More friction. Still sliding. No bounce. Lots of friction and don't fall asleep. I don't think we were, but let's just do that. Thinking, what's going on here? I feel like that the movement's very strange right now. It's not what I'm expecting. Temporarily turn off those side blockers. I don't know if they're doing anything for us with all this friction. We want, okay, let's tinker with the pivot point. Move it forward. Okay, yeah, that tilted backward now. And now that that is spread out, we want the weight to be heavy enough that it tilts back. So it, this might, it could be as simple as all we need is this block placed in that perfect spot so that it's enough to tilt backward. And then once it hits, Oh, man. Oh, that was so close already. A little closer. Come on. Oh, we need more frames. Nothing falls. And then, oh, too heavy in the front now. So how do we, is there any way to stop it from wanting to continue forward? Or is it just a weight distribution again? It could also be the curvature of these feet. But it did take like one step. It's the repetition we need, obviously. But now that tilted forward. Also, let's keep in mind the angle of the ground is a variable as well. Bink, bunk. And then, oh, and it's even so slowly going there, but then we do hit a tipping point. So let's just scoot that back a bit. This could be a very sensitive layout. Even that was too much. 
Ah, wow, those tiny tweaks in the back. Huge differences in... the behavior. Uh, I'm kind of feeling like maybe these need to, I can make them bigger and then scoot them up. I really think we should. That's probably colliding now. Um, What's a way I can do this? Can I turn off caps? That might be a, a way of working around it. If I turn off the caps and then feed each of them into a volume or into a cloth surface and I push them in there. I didn't need to rebuild them as uh, tubes. Turn off axis, scoot those up. Okay, so way huge rocking feet now. Um, don't need as much angle. Mm. Okay. And, um, okay. Just some change. We'll see if anything. Let's think. Um, try and move the center of mass upward. Need it to tilt backward. feel like we're dropping them that far, but it's enough for it to jitter. Also, based on the reference, it's slightly behind the front foot, so let's move that connector back. I hope these are behaving correctly. I'm using a negative value, which probably means these feet are inverted. I don't know if that's breaking anything, but I'll push them outwards, which should prevent that. <laughs> Just visually fix those up a bit. So we can more mechanically, cleanly see what's going on. Okay, yeah, I think the inverting of those normals helped. I don't know if I saved when it was pseudo working. I should have, but um, based on our angle, I wonder if the ground is still too tilted. So I'm going to lower that even more. Let's do five degrees. All right. This back end. What do we got here? Pivot higher. Just I'm just moving parts around, seeing what kind of results we get. The further towards the front of that is, the more it's going to want to tilt forward. The more we put it forward, the more it's going to want to tilt backward. But the pin that we saw seems more backward. Mm, this makes me think we should tilt the floor a little bit more. We'll go back to 10 and see if it argues with us. Whoa! Okay, it's not exactly perfectly balanced, but look at that. We've now gotten multiple steps. Bonk, bonk, bonk. Bonk, bonk, bonk. Yeah, okay. That's the basics of it going on right there.
that's a fun, simple mechanism. I wonder, do you see how it's kind of, um, it's stopping from falling backwards right now by hitting this piece, but internally there could be like a blocker that is relevant. It does fall forward really fast, but I don't know. Well, the point being, the point being, I, I don't even necessarily want to go too much further with this because mechanically speaking, we now have the mechanics working. The uh, like, yes, we could model this out into some cute wooden creature. I mean, maybe we could spend some time doing that because we rarely do. So let me think. Okay, so balancing wide, it's tilting forward. That's a big step and it really tilts forward before it goes back. Do we want to speed that up? And it tilts back a lot. I wonder if how much of this as a variable is I'm going to make another block, and this will be a blocker. And I'm going to shrink that way down and way down. So if I put this inside, I'm even going to move it down a little bit so we can visually see it. So it really shouldn't change the weight too much. You see how that now hit, and it wasn't able to tilt backward as much? It still is getting a lot of forward momentum. But that stops it from stepping backward too far. I was hoping if it didn't step backward too far, it didn't tilt forward too fast. Um, but now, like, maybe 8 degrees is a better balance here where it doesn't swing as far forward. Yeah, 8's enough to move. And, yeah, it's yeah that's quicker now. Taking the most minimal step forward. Seems like it could be relevant. I'm going to encourage it to fall backward even more. Try and make it back heavy. Bunk, bunk, bunk. There's, no, there's no mechanism happening. I wonder if um, the curvature on the front, like if that was uh, sharper. I'm just going to eyeball this. But if we take that front foot and I spin the curve a little bit more, and we, yeah, I mean, that's not exactly a clean arc. What do I want to do here? Um, we want it to be quite flat. So to make this flatter, we should increase the radius a bunch and then move it up a bunch. So that's now become flatter. So obviously visually absurd, but pull back on this end angle. So that's become way flatter. So it's going to be less inclined to tilt forward. Yeah, already that's a quicker step. I wonder if that can go almost like... It needs enough time for the back leg to go back. But that concept just worked really well. So let's do it again. Way more radius. Move it up on local Y. I think. Maybe not. Apparently not. It says why. Whatever. What axis is that? Okay, it's a Z. Oh, oh, oh. Lock everything but Y. There we go. My bad. Whoop. Okay, so way more shallow again. I love these. Uh, the, the reason I'm tackling this is I love these types of mechanical challenges. So, boom, boom, and then back, bonk, bonk. Okay, there we go. It's now way quicker to do the steps. The um, Does it get any? I mean, as soon as... Oh, it stopped. Why would it stop? Let's give it a couple more degrees. Bink. Okay, yeah. if it doesn't have enough excel, yeah, it needs to do that little pivot up front so the back can tilt backward enough. Bunk. Yeah, you need a little bit of time, which is what we talked about. So at this point, mechanically speaking, you see we've got the balance correct, where that is now walking. So there is always the level of, you know, now we've got mechanically walking. We don't need to... Um, Let me just 
from, okay, this actually doesn't tilt very far back, so this back foot doesn't need much length. I'm a little worried that it'll change the weight ratios, but I'm also, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a pretty forgiving mechanism. Yeah, see that back foot could be way smaller. It doesn't change anything. So anyway, to finish the earlier thought, if we wanted to complete this into some sort of animal, quick, everybody, what's an animal we should turn it into? I might go with the first choice unless I hate it. Somebody type in an animal. They did a hedgehog and they did... Um, I think the other one was an elephant. Um, anteater. <laughs> what? Anteaters don't have a very good silhouette, I think. Somebody said duck. I kind of I kind of like the idea of a duck. Yeah, let's do a duck just for fun. So um one of the main points is like <laughs> Yes, we've got the mechanism working now, so it goes to do we make it so that the physical geometry is still what drives it? We've already got a, a proxy here. We've got a shape that works. Um, you know, technically, we'd want this to be making a physical connection with it. And, but it goes to like, I don't really care that much about it being super duper well balanced for the physical form. We've already got the mechanics of it working. We could or we could not. It's not a big deal to me. Um, but anyway, let's. Um, I'm just gonna pull up a quick duck image, so I've got something in my head. Yeah, let's do it. So we'll just draw a duck pen tool. Let's start with the bill. Curve it out. Tangent actually almost immediately goes upward again. I'm g it's not going to be properly scaled because I didn't know what the, the initial scale should look like. Arc sharp. Arc sharp. Arc break. that one break and now that might want to go back further but curve curve we're definitely going to try and style this stylize it a bit more curve up break and I guess there's a little bit of Upward, break, and we can complete the bill. Okay, so now modify. So that's the back end of this looks terrible. Deeper scale, move all this down, better. Like these should scoot back a bit, and then these feathers can be exaggerated a bit more. Burp, burp, burp. Better. And then, if you're going with a toy duck, then I think you want to exaggerate several of these features, make the head curvier. Okay, we don't want it to be perfectly sphere, we need it to be duck shaped. Yeah, a little flatter. There we go, a little more forward. And the sharpness is fine. Actually, scale that up a bit. Yeah, get that curve going. The front need, doesn't need to be quite as wide. The bill's looking a bit goofy to me. I guess there's a bit of a curve in there. So let's do a cut. Scoot that down. 
and then scale that whole thing up. Eh, not amazing, but I don't want to spend too long on it. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Oops, not that one. Just going, trying to go for those like slightly cartoonier duck proportions. Yeah, good enough. So, if that is the duck, grab just the spline, and this can kind of go anywhere. So we can make it take up most of the space because the legs go internal to it. So that's actually doing a pretty good job. And you know, we might be able to balance it out with the full dynamics. So let's not, we're not closing the door to that, to that. So we extrude that out. And it looks like, actually, if we go closer to the physical reference, you can see that there's kind of an outer layer and an inner layer. So let's, let's do that. Why not? So we can extrude this. Um, we don't need it to have very much geometry. I'm going to keep it pretty light for dynamic purposes. So selecting the spline, I'll say every 15 degrees. So you can see it's, it gets relatively low poly. Actually, very low poly. And what's the thickness I'm going to put on this thing? I don't like auto mode, so I'll set it to Z+. Plus. I wish there was a center mode so that they could be at the midpoint. But it's currently 100 thick. Let's make it, hmm, do we do 50? Maybe, yeah, we'll do 50. And that means we need to need now to now scoot it back, negative 25, cool. Okay, so that gives us the midpoint of the duck. And then I will make a duplicate of it. Scoot that 25, hmm, yeah, 25 over. And let's modify it, so this one, is just going to be the wing a bit. So I'm going to delete this, <laughs> I'm going to delete the head from the side, but that's just going to, and let's set this to, where is it? Smooth interpolation. And actually selecting all of them, can I shrink them all in a bit? Yeah, so I'll scoot them all in a bit. And then we can manually clean up some of these. Cool. So that's a secondary layer. You see how that's feathering out? Pun intended. Um, let's see. If I just make a null, drop that in the null. I should be able to, where is one, copy paste one of these cloners already set up. And that should jump it very much in a spot I don't want it to. All right, fine, symmetry. How often do we use a symmetry object? Almost never. Symmetry object. Correct orientation, please. There we go. Okay, so now we've got more of a duck going on. Now. Um, I'll save this as the next version just in case we break it because I, I am going to try and make it fully dynamic just with what we've got going on here. So these become just body parts and we need to turn off everything that's not so we don't need that and then here's the main body. No, that's the blocker. Let's keep the blocker. Blocker. We'll make it a little more elegant but we don't need it. And that's the main body. We'll turn that off. Oh yeah, and then this main one actually needs to be hollowed out if we're making it accurate, which is fine, that's easy. Um, so here's the mid, and these will be the feathers. Okay, so the mid needs a cavity for the feet. I don't know, oh, this one's static. So honestly, that one doesn't need it, but the back one does. So that would be a hole that's going like that is the idea. But of course, that cut I just did isn't actually going to translate in. Whoa, my selection got real tiny. And there's no point in there. So knife, knife, cut, cut, cut. So that gives us a couple of points to work with. Scoot these in. 
setting. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not gonna get real picky. Technically, we can set those to hard interpolation. And then cut from approximately there to approximately there. And then delete that. And delete that. There we go. So now that should be the equivalent of the blocker, but it's actually part of the book, uh, part of the duck's body. All right. So the blocker can now be turned off. And that's going to be pretty good. And now what? Um, I don't think I don't think much. Let's get rid of some of the polygons here. Don't need any of those height segments and the rotational segments. Drop them down to 16. Drop them down to eight. Yeah, it's fine. The connector is still connecting to the overall body. These have become dynamic, so we just want to make sure they're not colliding. I don't think they will. And the feet probably don't need to be as wide, but we'll deal with that in a moment. So save that again. We still got the previous one. So this is probably way out of whack again. But let's see what happens. So it tilts forward. You know, it's not too far off. So um, the easiest thing would just be moving the overall shape back. We could also just say change the center of mass. And we could, you know, if we wanted to... You can't do custom. I'd have to link it directly. Um, I guess the best idea would just be scooting the entire body back. So if it's a little front heavy, then we just scoot the whole thing back a bit. We do have to fix the hole. Let's see what happens. Well, that's a tiny step, but it did it. Okay, so I'm thinking that we are not letting that tilt backward very much. There's probably a good chance that... Yeah, there's a good chance that the way it's pivoting... Let's view it from this angle. Yeah. Is it colliding with something? I turned those off. Let's move those up more. Maybe it's not block hitting. Whoop. Bonk. Okay, yeah, it did hit the back there. Okay, that seems pretty good. Bottom. Bottom. Okay, nice, nice, nice. Okay, all working mechanically, and it is actually that dynamic object of the duck working. Didn't even take much tweaking. Um, our pivot's actually way up there. So, actually, mechanically speaking, we need the pivot to go up to there. You know, if we're, mm, I'm starting to not care too much about the internal dynamics. How thin can we make the feet? There's a thought. Um, scoot those in. Whank, whank. And whank. Okay, little, little bit more duck-like. Okay, cute, cute. Um, if we're gonna make a bit of a render out of this, then. I don't want this to just be a floor. So let's make a cube. Make it whatever length we want to. And what degree? 10 degrees. Bink. Cool. We don't need it to fall very far. So we'll just do that. M making that edible. We can reset its axis to be at zero, meaning now we can grab this back end and put it at. Uh, don't select visible only. Select both of those and T for scale. What is it doing? Oh, turn off axis. Scale those down to zero. Scoot that until it's pretty much perfectly lined up on the ground. Just eyeballing it. Um, let's be precise though. 10 degrees worked well for us, so we won't uh, spit in its face. Okay, that should be that exact height. These points are no longer necessary, so. Dissolve. Ooh, dissolving those did not work out well. I mean, technically, those aren't doing much, but. 
And then if we wanted to flatten out the back here, which isn't necessary, but the cool thing is you can always go to a modeling axis and go to your X and I'll zero that out there. T for scale. Okay, so that should be all leveled out. Steal the dynamics tag, put that onto our ramp. Delete. So now we've got that ramp and we've got the duck. The duck should get its own null now, so I'll Alt G. Let's um, make it easier on ourselves and put the axis of the null right where the feet are. So it's kind of like, okay, that's at least the ground. And then that also gets the back foot. Body, duck, save. Um, yeah, so we'll move him back to the back of the ramp. Hit play, let's make sure he's still working. Step, yep, and step. Yeah, it's pretty fun. I, I mean, I, I do enjoy these dynamic challenges, so I'll, I will disproportionately spend time on them than we should, just like we did with the, uh, the sheep herding last week. Like, it's absurd, but it's fun to uh, put together. Um, I wonder, I mean, we could, I mean, this is kind of large, dynamically speaking. I'm curious if we could make it smaller. So let's just say we were trying to make it human scale. So obviously that's the size of, <laughs> that's the size of a person. And uh, this would be terrifying. So let's, uh, let's try and scale it down real world scale a little bit. See if it does continue to work. So I will save and select everything. And T for scale, start scaling down, 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 down. Move it down. T for scale. Down, 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 down. That seems reasonable-ish. Okay, now, just by it being smaller, it's possible that the dynamics all break. There's things we can do to fix it. But I'm I'm curious if it's faster, because bigger things visually fall slower, smaller things go quicker. So instead of speeding up the time, okay, yeah, it's getting twitchy. But that's probably because control D, dynamics. We just made this like one one hundredth the size, but the collision margin is quite uh, large. So I'm going to, first of all, put the scene scale down. So it's the ideal scale. And I'm also going to drop the collision margin down to 0.1, which is still pretty large. Let's just see if that helps. I mean, it helped. It's not exploding, but it's still not walking. Um, collision scale is zero. That can be dangerous, but let's just see if that does anything. And yeah, the overall scale. Yeah, he's not. Um, he's just kind of scooting, scooting his way down. Um, let's try adding a couple extra steps per frame. It's already running crazy fast. So, whoa. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's definitely running quicker. You see, everything's like quick, 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 quick. Um, so it's almost like we need to slow it down a bit. Um, yeah, it's yeah, it's not maintaining the overall energy that it needs because it's so quick. Um, I don't want to get bogged down in this stage of it. Um, we have yeah. I mean, I, what I wanted to do was have it all be kind of like very clean and realistic, and put it at the real world scale. But you can see how much pickier things are getting at this small scale. And I, I can't really think of any other setting because none of these are scale based. I, these are the only two ones that are based on the scale of the scene. Um, but nothing else changed, so I kind of don't know what to make of it. Maybe... Um, it's a long shot, but maybe it needs to fall a little bit. Nope. Yeah, so I don't want to spend a bunch of time getting lost in the weeds on that. There might be the proper calibration, but for the most part, I'm just going to... Um, I don't know if I saved over it, so I'm going to reopen the scene file, which should be back at the giant scale. Yeah, giant terrifying duck scale, but it works. So we can go back, and it just is working here. Yeah, scene scale is important. If it was important to do the scale, you should be building the dynamics at that original proper scale in the beginning. But uh, since we went this far, let's spend a, I will save it at the stage. And now let's save it again. And I will put it as 1D and 
call it red shift. So if you're on Patreon, you'll get access to this, but you won't be able to get access to all the materials and everything because to save us time, I will be using um, the Grayscale Gorilla Plus library just because it's, it, you know, Chad made an amazing collection of materials there. So if we were going to make this look a little bit prettier, um, I guess it will, this goes to, we do have the dynamic body and I'm scared. Well, I don't want to mess it up, but if we, if we do things like select the extrudes and we put caps on it, well, first of all, caps make things taller. So if I start dragging this cap up, you see it's going to make them start colliding with each other a bit. So, th so then we need to compensate for that, which isn't the biggest deal. Um, but you know, we definitely want some rounding on here. And then if we're going to render it, we want there to be a higher poly. Ca you know, a higher poly cap to make it look cleaner. I don't know if anything's going to have broken just from doing that, but the dynamics are going to, yeah, already you see it's like, no, I don't like it. Could be that it's colliding with different pieces and whatnot, um, which is likely the case. Let's go to the front view. Yeah, you see that really pinched in? It's probably pinching the feet. So we'll just eyeball it, push those out. And I mean, they did technically make them heavier. Yeah, still is working though. So good enough for that. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the extended idea would be putting, um, making a low poly proxy or essentially what we already built would be a low poly proxy. Uh, when it comes to these feet, they are not very well set up for beveling, but beveling is really important for making something look a little bit better. So let's see if it can handle being turned into a uh, parametric bevel. So we'll give it a uh, bigger offset, a couple subdivisions. Burp, burp. Yep, seems to be handling it okay. And it's still running quite well, dynamics-wise. It's still not that complicated of a scene. Uh, this ramp should also probably get rounded out. It's easy to copy that over. Any step here could like really confuse the dynamics, but it's actually handling it pretty well. Um, and then, like I said, we're in this giant scale, which is not good overall. And we could bake it, but I'm just not going to worry about that. So anyway, um, let's do a... We'll do a, like I said, we'll do some redshift. So first step, let's open up a redshift render view. You can hit go on that. Um, it's already saved. So what do we need? We need a light. Well, let's put a ground as well. So we'll just make a disk shape. Put a couple zeros on there. Round it out significantly more. Move that way down. Okay, and let us go and add a redshift light dome light, which gives you a nice ambient overview and we could load in an HDR. Let's go to HDRI Haven. Beep. And HDRI Haven. And we get their HDRs, which are amazing. Should definitely support them. Go. Got it. Go. What's it doing? HDRs. Go. It's going slow. That's what it's doing. Um, looks like HDR Haven's not going, or I lost internet. Hopefully not. Let's refresh the duck. Yeah, it looks like I'm still online. So, okay, that's seemingly not working right now. So, um, all right, so I just because we couldn't get to it, I will use um, Grayscale Gorilla's HDRI link. I will link, that's a plugin from Grayscale Gorilla, obviously. I think most people will know that. Uh, it's always a good idea, well, especially in test renders, to set that to preview. And now we can double click and we get um, previews from it. So I've got a couple of them installed. So it's not exactly a metallic setup, but we could always go with my uh, classic favorite, which is always uh, derelict one. It's not looking great here though. Pro Studios metals are great. I think Chad's newest pack is this metals too, which can give you some nice bright lights. We'll just get something that looks okay. Yeah, that's not too bad. We'll start out with that and we'll tweak it later. And like I said, like right now, I'm just going to 
use the grayscale stuff so that we don't spend a lot of time from scratch. We go to the materials tab now, go to everyday materials, go to wood. We got all these different types of wood. And I, I don't want the plank ones. That's a, let's use dark oak one and we'll use a wood maple or yeah, maple two. That might be all we need, although maybe a, I'll just grab a dark oak there just to get three. And the ramp can be made of anything, but if we make the ramp wood, why not? We'll just take a red oak. Okay, red oak on the ramp. Um, it's going to get all stretchy because of the UVs. Oh, it looks like that one was a panel one, whatever. But I'm, I'm going to do the cheap way and just set them to cubic. And it's going to be really tiny because of our giant scene scale. So I'll just crank those up. And that's probably a pretty good preset now, having scaled it up. So I want one for the body and back foot. So we're going to make the inside. Oh, yeah, that's already... Let's see, what do we got? We'll do well, that for the inside. And we'll do that for the feathers. No, let's do the opposite. And then the front foot, that should probably just be that same dark one. All right, so that's something very dark overall. And actually wanted that to be the warmer. Yeah, a little bit better. Okay, so we could crank up this HDR, which seems a little light for the default. So you can always crank up your exposure. So yeah, that's automatically going to jump us pretty well to something reasonable and something that's reflective. But then don't uh, don't discount making some lights. So making an area light. What I typically do is add a target tag, make a null, tell it to target the null, name that targ. So generically, I want this targeting. Where's the null? Here's the null. Let's just say that's kind of the midpoint. So now grabbing this area light. Once again, scene scale, kind of whack. But we'll scoot that way over. And as I pull it, you'll see that uh, unlock the axis. As I pull it around, you'll see it uh, is constantly aiming at our primary direction. Let's make it pretty big. Okay, let's see what we're actually making here. Uh, so by making it that large, it's gotten real bright. So pull back on its brightness. It's probably a good idea to look at it in isolation. So yeah, that's what this one is doing by itself. And make a duplicate of that. Top view, move it approximately. I don't dislike that. Oh, I like that though. Okay, we'll do that. So that's just with no HDR. Um, but yeah, then we can turn the HDR and kind of fill out the rest of the scene. Appropriately uh, brighten or dim these. Let's make one of them more. We'll go with the generic. Uh, actually, that's the rear lighting, so I'll go with a blue. And then our front lighting, counter it with something kind of warm. And it's not three point lighting, but we do have the ambient light, so that's something. Oh, the blue is a little saturated. Yeah, something like that. Um, let's see. I'll pull in one last material. Maybe that cork. I like the cork. Ooh, there's a softer cork. Let's make that the ground. Again, that's already scaled, so I'll make a duplicate. Cork, we're definitely see seeing the tiling, so I'll make that at least twice as big. That helps a bit. Okay, so now frame that up a bit. Yeah, not much of an environment, but I'm not worried about that. We've got the duck. Uh, the ramp definitely needs some contrast from the other one, so I'll just apply that. Good enough. Uh, now, obviously, you know, it would be nice mechanically to put the little pivot point in there because that's kind of implying the mechanics that are happening inside. You can do, do extra details of carving things in. This is the quick, the super-duper quick version. But uh, jump into our... Redshift render settings. We'll set that to a 1920. Whoops. By 1080. 
lock the ratio divided by two because we're on a stream all frames save yeah why not i'll save that into the episode renders let's just name it uh one a duck duck is also the file name cool okay and then redshift wise let's actually make it redshift now we get access to those settings i like the advanced settings 0.01 is way too detailed for us so we'll drop to 0.1 and if we are so inclined not, not a bad idea especially if we let this go for a few frames um, i do enjoy adding in the redshift post effects because I just don't I don't spend time in After Effects or anything so if you're not going to it's nice to be able to jump in here and do things like add in some bloom I mean I don't think it was a good sequence for bloom but if you wanted the lights to blow out we could start pulling back on this until you start getting a bit of a glow you know not too much but blowing it out a little bit's kind of nice and then exposure turning that on it I wish the default made it look exactly like the main but once you pull this in and we start uh, crushing the blacks a bit and this has a vignette inside, so we can darken those edges a bit. And you can change the, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, getting the post effects live before having it. Doing this means I don't have to, like, render it out as, like, a 16-bit or 32-bit to get, like, all the crazy extra detail. Yeah, something like that. A little blown out. But yeah, you could go and go and go more and more and more. And of course, we could do depth of field. That would just add in a lot of render time. So let's not do that for now. Um, I don't think there's much else to do. Let me take a look at... Let's see. Do, do, do. Yeah, anyway, that should do it. Um, let's send it to the picture viewer. I don't think it take, should take too long. I didn't put the settings up very high. So let's get a couple frames of that going. Yeah, and then you see, like, even the post effect, like, suddenly snap in. It's uh, flattening a bit. Like, you know, I would definitely tweak that a, f a bit more. But we're getting a frame, like, every four seconds. So this shouldn't take too long to get a little bit of movement. In the meantime, I'll check out the chat. I know I was completely ignoring the chat, but things were going well, so I didn't need to do it. Um, yeah, I, I, I should keep in mind that we can take things a little bit more to completion. I tend to be like, let's tackle the technical part and then move on. But, you know, spending all the time making it look a little bit more like a duck. In my head, once we got, once it was like mechanically walking, it's like, well, of course we can make it look like a duck or a unicorn or a moose or whatever animal we want to. Like, that's not a question. It's a, it was a technical challenge. So spending a little bit of time and making it look nice is, you know, not a bad idea. Um, let's see. We're going to let that render for a while. Um, Moretta, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> could dynamics be run? Like, could we have built this with scene nodes? No, there's no dynamics in scene nodes yet. Uh, I'm looking forward to whenever they do. That will be great. Um... What is um rendering character? What's marmoset? Marmoset with textures from substance. Okay, am I? I mean, I, I just don't recognize marmoset as a thing. So if somebody wants to tell me, it, it could be you know super ubiquitous, and I'm just not familiar with it. Um. Mm -mm -mm. Let's see. People starting to ask the next question, which is great. Start getting those piled up. Um, do, do, do. Yeah, I don't know why HDR Haven was hiccuping for me. It just didn't work right there. Um, have I seen a new... There is a new app to shoot 32-bit HDRs with an iPhone. Um, a little... Oh, it looks like Void is saying that's something that you worked on. I'm not familiar. If you want to send me a link, feel free. Um... Maybe the po posting that on Slack would be the best idea and not here. I'm not going to check it out during a live stream. Um, and, yeah, if I go back further, everybody's just helping me try and guess as to settings that might have fixed it. Um, 
Yeah, Dean mentioning that redshift object tag could have done subdivisions with as a post effect. But of course, subdivisions won't give you a nice clean bevel. They'll round things out, but you'd have to have like perfectly clean geometry to get like a perfect post effect um, dynamics effect or post or a render subdivision. We'd have to rent, we'd have to model it really, really, really cleanly to do it. Um, or potentially you could along those lines just as a thought. Um, you probably could get that really nice post effect subdivision. I never think about that. Although, you know, you're still doing the calculation. It just won't affect dynamics. But anyway, just to throw it out there, we could have taken something like the feathers here. And if I say bevel and there's round, but if I said solid and we get rid of all those subdivisions, you'll see it actually creates a single subdivision that pushes in and in. And this is now very well set up to be subdivided via like the render engine doing it as a post effect. So just throwing that out there. Very good point. I, I would never think of it that way, but that is a, a in production, I think that'd be something that'd be incredibly important for my own projects. That's like not necessary, but um, I'm hoping the dynamics is working, but it looks like it's still taking its, uh, it's still working on its very first step. So I'll keep on reading as those go. Um, let's see, Dean and Pierre are asking if Ricochet, which is of course a Rocket Lasso plugin, uh, could you make interconnected neurons? Not really. That's not what it's designed for at all. Um, I'm trying to think if there's if they would be useful along those lines at all, because it's one continuous line. You could always make one node aim at another node and get the proper length, but that would only be a single connection. So yeah, I don't really Ricochet's not really designed for that. There would be other tools that would be good. You know, I, I have other concepts in mind that could be good for that type of thing, but that Ricochet in particular would not help with neurons. I know neurons is like a really popular concept and something that we, you know, anything that can help do that would be powerful. I imagine a lot of people have clients that want neurons because <laughs> it just comes up very often. Um, it's a rendering tool set. Um, a rendering tool set in what? Inside of cinema? Inside of, is it a render engine? I just have no concept. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, round corner. I got to learn how to do round corner because every time I try and do rounded corners, it doesn't work for me. And maybe I'm just fundamentally doing something wrong. Probably am. I've, I haven't tried it too many times, but I've tried it at least twice. And both times I was like, I must be missing something. And I'm sure I am. Um... Yeah, mesh the spine potentially would be a better option, but yeah, yeah, not something to tackle right now. Do do do. Um, I like the monthly's question, but how to achieve the dynamic cutting? We'll check that out in a moment. The duck is pretty much taking its first step. I mean, I guess it's not the quickest thing to walk with the way we built it. But let's see what we got. I mean, it does have that like nice dynamic quality where it kind of. I know there's there's a there's a clunkiness to it that is appealing. Bump, bump, bump. That's fun though. Um, I guess I'm rendering out as a well. There's a risk of it uh, crashing, of course, but we'll I'll leave that rendering, and we'll try dynamic cutting with volumes, which sounds particularly dangerous, but. Eh, let's live life on the edge. Okay, so clicking on Monthly's question. Boink. Mute. What do we got? Come on, Tab. Come on over here. Okay, we've got uh, Julian Rivori. Julian Rivori. Whoa, look at that. The colors make that look kind of gross, but quite lovely. Yeah, um, I think you your instinct is right that there is some volume builder. Keep in mind when you're whenever you're looking at this type of thing, a very important thing to keep in mind is. Mm 
um, the material that's on it, is the material a very uniform material? Or is it something like if there's wood grain on it, then obviously the wood grain would be, you know, getting def deformed by this type of thing. But it's a uniform material, which does open up like tons of possibilities. Um, so, unfortunately, well, I mean, the very, well, I guess it can be something like a rounded cube. So just to make it something a little bit different. But yeah, I think your instinct is correct on this one. I would definitely go with volumes. Place it on the ground or bits. Feed the cube into a volume builder. Oh, um, that shape won't break apart very cleanly like the sphere did. So how could we make it? Uh, oh, uh, easy enough. Let's move it up in the air a bit. And then make a second cube. That will be up 50. 100 tall. I thought I typed in five. Yeah, I'm a little skinny. There you go. If it's standing on a platform like that, then that should uh, make it fall over. Um, so let's say we want to cut this. And then, oh, that would be kind of fun. Okay, let's go a little extra nuts here. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, let's make that thinner. Put that back into the, um, I suppose I could be in a symmetry object. Whoop. Cool. So if we do that, my thought is, what if we make a buzzsaw just to, for fun? You can make a nice buzzsaw from the cogwheel. The cogwheel has a mode called ratchet, which is kind of like a buzzsaw. So that kind of gets it, it puts us right where I want it to be pretty much instantly. So extrude a bit. Not very much though. Z five. Five on the extrude definitely means it should be scooted back. Actually leaving that at zero is good and then we'll make the spline go negative 2.5. So now it's centered but the extrude is zeroed out for us. So anybody even that should be put into a null. Saw. So we can now, I, you see I made that gap here so we can make a buzzsaw fly through it. So we'll do that. Uh, I want that to be continuously spinning forward. Um, something like signal would work there. Here's another trick we can do. Let's put it into a cloner and make a clone of one. And then I'll feed that a plane effector. And I'll tell the plane effector to rotate what Axis. Nope. Third time's a charm. Yeah, like that. I guess that is supposed to be the spinning direction. I want that to be kind of like no matter what I do, it's the opposite of what I want. Okay, but anyway, that's what we want. We want it spinning this way. So I'm going to give it 90 degrees on that. So in the fall off, I will feed it a time effector, unclamp it, and now over the course of 30 frames, it is going to do a 90 degree rotation. So if I play, you see it's spinning. And it's possible that we, yeah, I, you got to go slow here because it, because of the nature of this buzzsaw. If we go really quick, you're going to start getting optical illusion of it spinning quicker. But now it's it'll spin forever because it's a time node going forward, and we unclamped it, so it'll just spin and spin and spin no matter how much uh, we set the time to. So it's a clone of one. Okay. Uh, technically, actually, I always forget, but if we just put that inside, let's turn off the cloner and put the plane in here. If I say affect the object, then it just affects the object directly, too. So we don't even need the cloner. It's only something I recently sort of discovered for myself. So um, anyway, that gives us a buzzsaw. And yeah, if we're getting real fancy, let's put a cylinder inside of there. And ooh, let's make two more cylinders. Put that into another symmetry. There you go, keeps that nice and simple. Make the pin a little thinner. And round out our caps, make it look kind of soft and cartoony.
There we go. Okay, so we got our buzzsaw. This is all a child. Oh, that's not all a child of it. That is now all. Ooh, okay, don't do that. Make that into a null. And then put those both in there. So that will now be the blade. And that will be the saw. Okay, cool. So that is now something that could be easily keyframe forward. Um, although, you yeah, know, if we're making this correct, I should probably move that up more and scale up our blade. Oh, that gets scarier. Okay, so that's our setup. So, okay, uh, we should save it. Now, my thought is, mm, because it's a cube, it's a really clean shape, but I do think a volume is a nice way to go to get that the kind of bulge out of it. So that's still my inclination. Um, okay, so let's do this the right way. We're gonna need a couple shapes. The easiest way to do this will be to make a spline, and that spline will automatically go. Let's put a rigging constraint tag, transform, which is formerly PSR. I want that to go wherever well, the saw goes. That's fine. The saw is pivoting from the mid middle point. So there is now this giant end side. I'll give that lots of points so it gets very round. And we put that to the scale. So that's essentially where the saw blade begins to hit it. So with that being the first shape, we could feed that into... Mm, how do I want to do it? We got, we, got, we got some different methods to do here. I'll feed into a sweep. And inside of that sweep, feed it a rectangle. And we can shrink that down. So now it's a very controllable kind of tube shape. Yeah. And then we can make a duplicate of that. copy paste and then we can make that one be a little bit smaller we're going to tweak all these I'm going to intentionally make that offset and I'd love for that to be centered like I said I really want extrude to be able to center and here we're seeing it like a dozen times but we don't have it so let's make that a thickness of I don't know let's say five again let's do ten why not so we'll say ten Oop, ten I say sometimes I click too quickly and cinema doesn't like it um, now that is offset, so I will select the tag, go into offset, and now we can offset this by going negative 5 because it's 10, so that should be centered up. So now it's really easy to hit T for scale and scale this up or down as well. Okay, so if we've got our cube and we are going to want to take bytes out of it, so let's save that. Feed this cube into a volume builder, into a volume mesher. We should get a nice rounded cube right out of the gate. Depending on the resolution, we could increase that or decrease it. Let's increase it a bit so it sharpens up the corners. And then, if this is going to be chopping through it, what would we want to happen? Well, I would want this. I'm going to call it bite. That should get subtracted out from it. So, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to remote. I'm going to hide that cube and then remote link into it. Ooh, it jumps it up into the air because that is offset. That's fine. We just have to reset that. Okay. I, I If we're going to remote link something in, it's good to remote link everything in because it can get confused otherwise. Um, okay. So then let's take the byte and put it there and then say I want to subtract it. So it's hard to see here, but let's hide, hide. And now you can see that's actually taking a byte out of it. So that's why that was called byte. Um, now, I w let's get the bulge from it. But the bulge is a little bit trickier because if we take um, bulge, bulge, how the heck do you spell bulge? There we go. I kept trying to put a D in it. Um, okay, if I feed that in, you'd want that to be a union. But now you see it's going to actually do this entire rotation outside of it and link the entire way around and that's not what we want so here's my thought what if we feed in the cube a second time and that cube gets put into a folder 
inside of let's put that to normal or it's union so i want to turn everything else off let's just do the step at one step at a time so that's the same cube now let's say that this cube gets inflated so i'll say i want to dilate and erode which is inflate and we can inflate it by whatever amount we want so currently it's five which is maybe too much maybe not we'll say five for now so now there's an inflated cube so then we'll say, OK, now that there's an inflated cube, we'll take that bulge and put it on top. And now I want to see them where they intersect each other. So now this is just where those two things exist at the same place. It's a little thin, so I'm going to hit T for scale and start scaling up um, you know, that bulging area. And then uh, now we're seeing just those two. So it's where those two happen to intersect. Uh, let's inflate it maybe even more. Why not? So we'll push it up to 10. Okay. Anyway, you see, as I increase the inflation of the cube, you can imagine the cubes inflating. And as those inflate, those two intersect in a more complex area. So with all that happening inside of a folder, we could now say, now combine that on top of the byte being taken out of the box. And now we get only the bulge right on the kind of bleeding edge of where this is moving. So these are already linked in on the saw blade so they have to move forward and we don't need them to rotate so i will turn off that rotation because that just might create uh, some sort of staticky thing going on but yeah that should create a cut as it chops through and it's going to create the bulge on both halves which is kind of neat um, and we could make that more or less forward if we wanted to so i could increase that you can see as it chops through it's a, it's hitting it a bit but that is based on our bold shape so i can just scale that out further and you see as i scale that out it's going to push it further and our inner saw blade the bite i can scale that out to make sure that that's a little bit further and honestly let's um inside of the volume let's move the bite above it so that will actually subtract out both of those shapes so that can actually bite out. Let's grab the bite, scale it more. Okay, there. See, if I get this right, we can actually bite into that bulging out area. And that all happens, you know, on top. So it looks pretty clean, actually. So having done that, let's keyframe. Those are already going to follow it. I will move the saw blade above just so it's kind of like the saw happens. These two follow. So now we can just keyframe that. So... Um, is there something more specific I want to do? I don't think so. Well, let's temporarily turn off the volume. I would like the saw blade to start here. I guess what's actually happening in the animation, we can do this multiple ways, but the, in the animation, I think that the objects are passing through. So I guess the saw blade wouldn't move. So let's put that at zero. And then everything else moves, which is not a bad thing. So that will be our, come on, double click, conveyor belt. And the idea there would be, um, is there anything I can think of to be fancier? Not really. Let's just make one. I don't think I'm going to put the effort in to make it looping. Keyframe on X. And then I don't know how long I want it to take. Oh, that's chugging along why did that oh it's we're still rendering that's why <laughs> anyway how long do i want that to take the cut one two three oh. okay the as it's processing a new frame it takes an extra chunk anyway let's have it be about 100 frames about 100 frames later i'll have it have moved over to Finicky, let's say there. Okay, and selecting those two, I'll set that to linear so it's a constant speed. Let's check out our duck. Let's see how he's doing. Oh yeah, we're running out of frames here too. Bottom, 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 bottom. Yeah, working nicely though. Uh, I think it was extra chugging because I it was playing and now we ran out of cached frames. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, so if we play and that gets cut, okay, that's the idea. 
So we could, of course, layer up a lot of things on top of that. The uh, belt itself, if we wanted that to be something animated, let's say this floor is way down and the belt would be kind of like infinite. I mean, we could do this in different ways, but yeah, we could put the belt and now that belt becomes a child of um, this moving along. So that would you know just travel with it. And because it's constantly moving forward, we have the opportunity to, once it does the cut, to have the two pieces fall apart. Um, actually, I just thought of something that could be a problem. Oh, no, I guess it's not a problem because that's where we would do the transformation. So let's take a look at what we get now. So hide the original box. And I don't know how it's a relatively, I don't know why we're getting the echo of the saw blade. I guess using that, yeah, there's a, like a refresh issue when I move the mouse over. So mostly let's ignore that. But primarily what we're concerning ourselves with is this cut. Cut, cut, cut. So yeah, that nice clean uh, leading edge of the saw blade pushes through. Eventually it will cut its way all the way down and it's doing its thing quite nicely. So yeah, eventually that will cut through the entire box and now it's in this midpoint, which is fine. And somewhere in these frames is where we would flip it to the baked version. So let's do that, because why not? Um, we can probably make that uh, cut look a little bit cleaner too. What's nice is none of this is like cached or anything. So uh, I noticed where, like right around here, like that doesn't look so great the way that happens to be colliding because of the curvature. Um, what's the thought there? Um, several things we could do. First of all, I, I don't. I want to keep this low poly because it's just gonna, you, you can see how we're almost almost able to play it in real time. Um, we got options as far as making this rectangle larger, and I can see this going to like make a larger area for that to be uh, curving around. Um, yeah, the curve. No, I guess it just depends on the height of it. If this was lower, that would look like less of a visual problem. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm actually worried too worried about that because then inside of the volume we could do something like a smooth you gotta go real easy on that but we could round those out a bit to make those smoother yeah like yeah you see immediately how that's pooling and closing up which is kind of nice but smoothing definitely can slow you down let's see how bad the hit is here not too bad and then we also have the option of putting a smooth deformer inside of the mesher and you can see that's going to smooth it out even more so rounding everything out would you know it might not be a bad idea to put one or two in there just to get it extra rounded out and then we could put a subdivision surface on after the fact so now we get this shape going through and then fully cut we get that nice leading edge and then somewhere right around here would be the point where it's like, okay, it suddenly swaps from one shape to the other. Um, I, having this volume be external and linked remotely to this cube is throwing me off a bit. Um, like just in my head, like the intuitiveness of it. Um, but the swapping point will be important. But frame 50 is a nice clean mid frame. It is fully cut, so let's just say at frame 50, suddenly we get the new version of it. So here's the thought. We make a duplicate. We make it editable. And it's still getting smoothed, which is completely fine. And in this moment, what happens? Okay, let's just swap the visual of it. Or, well, I guess we'll swap the visual of this one. So we'll say, yes, that's what it looks like here. And this measure... We'll say all three of those, why not, are enabled. One frame forward, hit the letter G. One frame forward, and now those are all off, keyframed. And this is, oh, that is now on. So one frame earlier, that should have actually been off. Off. Okay, so this is now cut in that moment, but it should appear right here. That's the idea. So let's see what happens. So, and then that's cut and suddenly you see it speed up, but like there should be a perfect continuity in between those frames. 
where suddenly one turns off in the exact moment that's turned into a completely unrelated model. And now that's an unrelated model, we can do whatever we want with it. So the reason I put it on that little pedestal is so that those could tip off. And we, you know, you could do it dynamically. Um, maybe it's not very high poly. So right at frame 51, let us, those are smooth. I will bake that down. So um, connect and delete. So it's been baked down. Select this, UW, UP, delete. And now I split them into two separate models. So there's one side. Oh, I did it again. Okay, here's what you do. You select one polygon, select all connected, U, P. That automatically creates a new object for you. Then you have to go back to the original and hit delete. Now these are two unrelated models. So let's just go one and two. And I don't know how well this will work, but let's make the conveyor belt a collider body. Simulation collider body. And both of these can become dynamic. Actually, yeah, that's a collider body, but also that's a collider body. And it should be a static mesh. So the thing it's bouncing off of. So now that that has happened, we can make these two halves of the block simulation rigid body dynamics enabled. Go back one frame and say dynamics not enabled. So they, they're not dynamic until that exact moment. So now in this exact moment that they become dynamic, uh, and then we can make those uh, hopefully calculate really fast by saying that the shape will just be a box because they're essentially boxes. So we hit play and then bronk. Yeah, and those two pieces, <laughs> well, they fall off the conveyor belt, which is funny. Just widen up that conveyor belt. Chop, 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 chop. Suddenly it turns into a new, a new object, bronk, and then the two pieces fall off. Perfect. Uh, pretty much exactly what I was hoping for. Um, you know, you, we could make this inner shell have extra detail if you want to. Just take a bite out of it. Those are those are their own model now. We don't see inside of it because the saw blade should be doing the, the chopping. Maybe we could, maybe we wouldn't. There's additional things we could do if we wanted to uh, make those be a little bit different. Um, it looks like the entire animation is currently only designed for these couple frames. So we'll just stop this at frame 100. Like I said, I'm not going to bother doing the uh, looping aspect of it. Um, but yeah, getting the saw blade going, the nice bulge, and then letting those two pieces fall off to the side, working quite nicely. Buzz, 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 buzz. Never be afraid to swap a model out. Yeah, it's too bad when you kind of have to uh, like manually keyframe something, but if you've got the design down, like that is not a lot to ask of the shape to just be like, okay, and turn off, turn on, bunk. Of course, if you know the client makes a change, then you have to go back and change both of them, and that's where it's a shame to have to do that type of thing. But it works perfectly fine, even with this volume being relatively clean. Oh, because I split those apart, it looks like their keyframe, their uh, visibility, isn't activated properly. So, one frame forward, on, on, one frame before, off, off. Not much of a difference; they were in the same spot. Chop. Yeah, uh, any questions about this one? Do, do, do. Should have been a brain. I wouldn't make it a brain. Brains gross me out. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, I got to get rid of some uh, the spam thing coming in. Let me see if I can kill it off. What do we do to kill it? Bump. Block. Block. And boom. Don't is I thought we had some people in the chat who are mods. Do we not? We gotta make some of the regulars mods so they can take care of these spam bots that come in. Um but yeah, uh, that mostly covers what I wanted to here. Let's see. Let's see. Could tie that inflate to the speed of the saw blade? <laughs> Is 
so mulch settles if the saw stops. Um, well, the bulge would settle if the saw stops. I don't think um, I don't think there'd be any need for that. If this stopped moving forward, it, the that bulge will just stop at that particular spot. If you backed off, it wouldn't. It would erase out. But if you wanted it to stop at a given spot, you could just make the uh, these chasing objects chase that. Or in the exact same way, we could be like, oh, this is the frame where it stopped, and that would just remember. You could just make, again, a copy of it and then hide the visibility. So if we made this editable, obviously even right now, if I make this editable, that is now just a model. So if I scoot it away, it is now permanently deformed in that way. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, let's check out the duck. He's still rendering away. Bump, 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 bump. He's a trooper. Okay, let's see what we've got. How much time have we got? Oh, we got at least 20 minutes. Let's see if we have any questions coming in. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Mr. L. Good evening from <laughs> Chicago back to Norway. Uh, let's see. We got a second of Mick has a question. How would I go about creating this transitional effect? Let's see what we got here. Mute. There's an ad playing. Skip the ad. Height field, chocolate something or other. Height fields in motion, man versus machine. For, where's it? off? Hive. Oh, so off is probably the conference. Uh, and this is posted by the official Houdini channel. So you're asking about the transitional effect. So let's see what we got. Whoa. Ba -ding, ba -ding, ba -ding. What's it turning into? Oh, it's, a, it's the Houdini pig head. Um, you just kind of get that ripple going. You kind of got this chocolate and then a ripple and then it gets revealed um what's my thought on this the um the rippling effect is cool it's specific there's different ways mm. I don't. I have a old grayscale gorilla tutorial I made back when fields first came out, where I made some pretty crazy things with fields. Like I, I figured out how to make it generate ripples. Um, let me go fifty by fifty. So we're gonna keep this pretty low, especially with my computer also rendering. We'll we'll be working from vertex maps, not surprisingly. I'm sure some of you might have guessed that. Hmm. Set vertex weights. Okay, so we got a vertex map now on a plane. So you've got, yeah, the, the basic idea being you've got one shape and you've got a different shape and there's gonna transition in between. The specific questions about that kind of ripple effect that was happening. Um, yeah, I've got a thought for the ripple effect. So what if, let's keep this methodical. Let's do this very cleanly. I want the plane to use fields. Don't need the freeze, at least not for now. I would like a spherical field, which appears in the center. Technically, we could even start from that, but let's automate it even more. So let's make that be pretty tiny. So that should be full power on a single point. Now we need the freeze, so I'll make a new freeze. The freeze will be set to grow. It is growing a radius of 10. That should be pretty much all that needs to do this. So now we'll get the growth. You see how it's very square. That, that makes sense. Uh, if you want to get around that, we have to do something like increase the radius. So we'll say 20. And now you'll see it's going to be a lot more round. If we say 30, it'll be even more round. But that means it's now going three times as fast. So if that's three times as fast, what we could do is make this a third as the speed. I'm going to go even slower than that. So now it is spreading out quickly. But you see that it takes longer to get there. But I actually would like this to take a very long time. So let's say 1%. So it's spreading out a lot, but very slowly. Possibly too slow. 
let's say 3%. Um, I don't like that initial transition, but maybe we just need a little bit of uh, radius on the initial shape. 15, perhaps. Oh, and there's a thing. The freeze gets confused. The freeze, I'm not sure if there's bugs or if I just don't understand it on some level. But even right now, it's like, oh, that doesn't look right. Well, I hit it clear so it can update based on what the plane effect is doing. And even that didn't seem to update very well. Do I need to set that to add? Yeah, okay. We have to set that to add. And now you can see we've got a little bit more going on there. And remapping, let's give that a full range. So at least it's a little bit more rounded. Yeah, how big do we need to make that? Hmm. The first few frames are not helpful, but then we could animate it into position. Let me see if that helps at all. So at the start, it'll be completely away. And then over the course of, let's say, 20 frames, it'll move to zero. So let's see if that looks a little cleaner. Yeah, a little bit. What I really want to have this do is have a very wide range. So let's make that go one degree again, but let's increase the radius even more. Mm, come on, the radius. Oh, this is so frustrating. How do I make this? Maybe, maybe I shouldn't be doing it via a growing freeze. We've already got the spherical concept going here. If we have a very large sphere, then as this pushes down through, you see how we get this nice kind of gradient happening. So here's the new thought. Let's not use freeze. If we keyframe at the beginning, this all the way above the ground, keyframe, and at the very end, we'll put it at zero, which is full strength. It's in the middle now. Keyframe that. So now, we should transition from, oh, did I not keep her in the beginning? Ah, oh, I do the thing I always do, which is I overrode the same keyframe. Okay, anyway, now it's keyframed. So now you see it's gonna slowly sink down into the shape, just fine. Okay, so if that is a full transition as determined by the spherical fields remapping going from zero all the way to 100, what we can do is ramp this somehow or remap it so inside of the field i can say i would like a mm, i guess you can do a formula well a formula is a separate thing is there a yeah there's a formula here so this formula already out of the gate is probably gonna do something you see how it's like doing that crazy wave transition um you could do the formula what i'm thinking is let's do it a little more manually with a curve if we use this curve, actually, oh, I can show you something cool. If we make a couple of points here, and I, I do want it to be pretty dang even. Let's have it flatten out. So you see it's 20%, 20% handles, 20% handles. It's going to eight. So that should be pretty rounded. Okay, so this is now going up and then down, okay? If we go into our sphere, Currently, it is remapping out to a maximum of ten or a maximum of a thousand. But what if we say, or a maximum of a hundred? What if we say ten times more, which is a thousand? So now it's a thousand times as powerful, or it's you know ten times as powerful. So pretty much the edge, the bleeding edge is only, uh, or the fade out is only on the very, very edge. So in the curve, if I turn this on, you're going to see that we get that single ring on the outside, which by itself is pretty cool. But if we tell this to, after the curve, tell that to, I think, continue? No, loop? Yes, okay. If we set that to loop, it is now seeing that overshoot of a thousand, and now we get 10 rings instead of one. Um, so pretty cool effect you can get from that. So yeah, we get 10 rings as that slowly passes through. So that gives us kind of a cool ring effect just in general. So you can also imagine that you know those ripples kind of went in. Uh, we could continue animating this outward. Could be a shape that it does. We could just move it downward. Um, just for fun. 
I'm just going to keyframe this to keep moving straight down. So eventually they'll shrink out of the way, which is not exactly the transition, but I'm not, I don't want to recreate what they have exactly. So this should just pass straight through. So we get the ripples traveling through. Uh, I would like this to be linear. So I'll set that to linear and the first one to linear as well. So that will just c travel at constant speed. Okay, now, so that's a sphere going through, but keep in mind that you know, this curve comes after as a separate object. So we could do th some things like overlaying this to get some, some different effects so that we can create a random and I'm gonna set it immediately to overlay and that overlay, I want it to be pretty large. So I'm gonna start, mm, set it to normal for a moment so we can see what we're looking at. And I'm gonna increase the scale of the noise. And now you can see there's a bit of a noise doing its own thing. So if we set that to overlay and then turn on the curve, you can now see that those are distorted now, our resolution isn't amazing here. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have it be so many rings. Let's do only five. So, oop, not 50, but 500. So, yeah, there we go. Half as many rings now. But that doubles our resolution. So now, that overlay is causing some distortion in the way that that spherical wave looked. And it doesn't have to be overlay. It could be a multiply. Um, but, yeah, anyway, you see what we're doing. I do like overlays, though. Um, that random field could get some animation speed. Why not? Let's say it's got to be pretty quick. So I'll say 200 and play that through. And now, yeah, you can see a little, well, okay, maybe a little crazy. 100. Yeah, so, you know, it's a little distortion on top of it. So it's not quite even. Something you can do is feed in o multiple overlays because overlays, you can't really crank the power up. I could put a second one of the exact same noise and they're all referencing that same random field. So we could get additional levels of distortion by overlaying multiple times if we wanted to. You can also, like I said, we could also set this to multiply and that'll just have a significantly larger effect on the overall shape as that is sort of transitioning out. Um, so yeah, that gives us that uh, yeah, it's kind of giving us that ripple effect. And that could be doing, now that can translate into whatever we want to. So, um, I suppose I'll just make a duplicate plane and this one won't do anything. And so that's just a simple regular plane. Tell it what we want it to do. In this case, I would like it to deform. So I'll feed it a plane effector. Rename it to dot deform. Make it a child. Set that to affect the point. I want it to push. Let's just make it absolute. So I'll say transform space effector. Now it actually does push up. And that will be limited to the fall off of this vertex map. And now you see it's translated into getting pushed upward. That can get pushed up the exact amount that we want. And even here, this is where you can layer things up and make it interesting. If I rewind hit play, that should. And then. Okay, so, you know, it's doing a fine job. Um, but yeah, these things can always get layered up more. We could feed this spherical field in. I was going to feed in the spherical field again, but I did set that up to 500. So maybe it would be a good idea to make a second spherical field. I'll make it a child and then kill off the keyframe so it doesn't move. And make sure to put a 2 on the end. So yeah, that one could be dragged in after everything else and set that to multiply. And also set it to 100. There you go. And now you can see it's going to be more powerful in the middle and then weaker on the edge. So, yeah, I'll just calm that down a little bit. And you can see here how we can get very, we can art direct and get a very precise effect of exactly what we want it to be as it travels through. In addition, you know, as I said, we could take this and scale it out more. You see, as I do that, these, um, whoop, not that one. I guess we want both of them. If we keyframe this, we could also have the size go larger. So you see those rings could get bigger as we go. Um, so we're not stuck to it like fading in and fading out. It could get larger and eventually fade out of the screen by having gotten larger. So mechanically, very directly controlling what you want this to do, you could start creating this. You, know, you can create these types of effects, which is pretty neat. And then it just turns into whatever was underneath and you want to transition into the other one. You could just have them overlay in whatever way. Um, that you are inclined, let them fade in, fade out. Um, um, how do I want to do that? We could spend a moment doing it. I'm going to rename this tag to one, make a duplicate and name it two. This one will do almost, it won't do any of this stuff. 
it's going to be real simple. Let's just make a box. So yeah, that should just be a vertex map that vertex map. Oh, that one's in the way. Uh, you can see there's just a box. Um, actually, you probably make some sort of diamond shape. Um, but yeah, that, that'll be vertex map two. And let's make another one. And that will be vertex map three. If we are inclined, which I am, we can make text. Actually, I found out recently the text is really slow to calculate. Uh, I want something simple, though. So let's put a letter R, middle, center. Something I've been doing a lot is put that into a uh, connect object. So now I can scale it from the center and it won't mess up everything else. Anyway, that can be fed into our third field as a spline. That can be set to a mask on Y. And now you see that we get that shape. We even have a fade out on the edge if we want to. So if those are our two shapes to transition between in our main plane deformer. I would put in perhaps we can just feed all three of these in and then have them do their thing however we want to. So um, what am I inclined to do here? Let's move one and two down. You know, nothing's happening there and that's overriding. But if we set that to be additive on top of it, you know, here's the simplest form. We could just keyframe that down. Actually, probably don't even need to. If I just try, if I just melt, turn that, off, turn off our ripples, pull this down. You see, it's just going to fade from one to the other. Like super simple. Like that couldn't be easier. So, uh, keyframing this whole thing, which I typically don't like, just keyframing the entire field. Uh, maybe we can do an individual layer. I don't want to keyframe everything, so if we just keyframe the opacity, it'll still put a mark there, but we'll, at least it won't keyframe everything. And let's have it start like 15 frames in. Um, 25 frames in. And then at 65, I will have had that transition out. So now the rectangle is entirely there. And now, so now you can see we just get that crossfade. But now let's let our other effect, which is going to fade in and fade out already naturally, which is adding on top of everything, Let's let that transition in. So now you can see we get that ripple. One fades away. The letter R comes in, and the other thing fades itself out. So, like, we just have complete control over the way any of this stuff is going to morph for change. And that's the simplest possible method I could do. Um, yeah, letting those all morph between. Uh, if we unclamped, that might even go up. Yeah, that'll now these ripples can go above it. So you can see how that's going to kind of like shockwave through. Uh, all, all of those layering up on top of each other. We didn't save this, which is a little dangerous. Bum, 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 bum. Vertex map transition. Um, but yeah, last thing I was going to say is you could do things like a delay or decay as well. I think that will work in this circumstance. So if I say I want a, oh, that's delay. Yeah, delay. So it's smooth. A smooth is actually pretty cool. It's subtle, but keep an eye on it right now. If I hit play, you see it's all going to do its thing, and then it transitions, it's fine. But if we put turn the smooth on, then it, the transitions are going to be slower, and everything just fades into each other a little bit more. I'm going to crank up the strength, which might not look good, but we might be able to more clearly see what it's doing. You see how it's like forcing it to more slowly do that morph? So maybe putting that in between here and saying that the morph between the square and the R should be slower and not the overall shape. And so that delay is now doing that. That's okay. And then we could say, I also want a uh, another delay up on the top, and we'll make that one. I don't be any good, but let's do a spring. So now there should be some extra springiness going on. Uh, because of the uh, these frame-based effects, we need a few extra frames for that to finish. So yeah, now we get this rippling on top of everything else as the spring effect keeps it slightly alive. And keep in mind, um, that's being deformed. We could always put a jiggle. Do, 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 jiggle put a jiggle after that so that's also layering up, up on top of all of those um let's uh go easy on the stiffness and yeah yeah that's really adding a lot of well there's definitely all cast but look at all like the extra jiggling we get at the end if we go um easy on those and then it settles in and then, like that transition gets completely hidden as those happen 
And of course, we could be, you know, you could be passing a linear field through it from the side, so it transitions more from one direction or another. The, uh, the ripple effect we did is just happening to go from the center point, because that's where we placed it, of course. Um, a smoothing deformer, never out of place in this type of environment either. Just take off those super sharp edges. Even just two will take off those sharp edges, and it calms down. And you just get the transition from one to the other. And like you know, this is like I said. Even even now, this is as we layer these up with delays and whatnot. This is still incredibly clean. You can imagine all the different. We could mask one out and mask it out from the other. We could be adding masks in. That would be a separate linear field. The possibilities really get endless, and it could be art directed in any way that you want. So, um, yeah, it just goes to keep a keep an open mind for ways of combining these. Building very clean. Mechanical rigs is a good idea. Also, I was, you know, wasn't even talking about, it, but just keep in mind the way you could uh, layer these up on the original shape. Like right now, it's just like, oh, that this is our square, and it's statically a square. But this could also be animated. Like as we we know that the transition is going to happen from twenty five to sixty five, so we could have this start to wobble around or get the stro get distorted or fade away. You could animate this box to shrink in and stretch out like while that transition is happening. So it kind of fades into this additional shape. I mean, just because why not? Let's do that. So at 25, let's keyframe its scale. And then we got to do it pretty quickly because it's going to fade out quick. So I'll go to here, make it a lot smaller, a lot taller, and keyframe that. And so now that shape by itself, we have independently animated that to do something. And I mean, we, we could continue it where that will go fully skinny, but we needed that midpoint to do something quick. Otherwise it wouldn't really do anything. And you, you could keyframe the R as well. The R could be fading up somehow. Once again, uh, the, the R is not gonna matter too much until about the midpoint. And at the end, we wanna make sure it's ended up here. But let's see what, like, uh, okay, I'm gonna spin the R. I'm gonna spin the original text spline. So that could be interesting. So that is on B. So I'm gonna keyframe B. And going back to about 45, that can have spun to be a lot thinner. Keyframe that as well. If we wanted to keep that motion going on, we could always spin that a little bit more. But that's just going to make it wider, so maybe not. So now we've got those independently doing their transition. If we go back to the original, we still got this blob. We can make this blob change in whatever way we want it to. But now we go back to our final plane, which, of course, is being modified by all of those. And let's check that out. I didn't feel the change as much as I was hoping we would. I guess the uh, this this big, our very big uh, add effect is like overwhelming it. So let's get rid of that. And yeah, okay, you can't you can see the transition happening there. Also keep in mind this delay is like, yeah, calming it down a lot. So if we turn off that delay, you can definitely feel that shape. Yeah, see that that's already better. Um, yeah, I mean, look at that. This is even without that blobby transition. Literally, we're not using the ripple setup that we did. This is just transitioning between those two. And look at that cool, crazy ripple effect that we got. And that's with a little bit of spring and some jiggle. And you automatically get this crazy shape overall. Awesome. Uh, and if we turn the ripple back on again, I wouldn't be surprised if it's overwhelming. But let's see if we can feel it at all. Yeah, a little bit. The, it's not as much, but I definitely feel like it gets a little skinnier. There's more action happening in the center, even if it's hard for the eye to catch specifically what's going on. But yeah, by breaking these uh, these elements apart, by making a transitional shape and then one shape and the other shape, then our rig over here gets really clean. But if all this crazy stuff was happening just within this singular field, that could get overwhelming. So I really like breaking things apart that way. Uh, anyway, that should, uh, as a final thing, you could always have the uh, this fade out near the edge. Let's create a box field, and that needs to be double box, box, box field, double, and then you get the transition on the edge, and if we set that to multiply, so in here it's say multiply, all that crazy stuff that's happening right on the edge should now fade out. So you see, it doesn't quite get to the edge. The jiggle is still causing it to get to the edge. And we could put a fall off in the jiggle. But yeah, now it's a little more stable on the on the uh, ground area. Actually, you know, just out of curiosity, 
let us do that in the jiggle there's a fall off put the same box field so let's see what happens yeah that works perfectly fine and wiggle and calm let's uh it's just for fun do 200 percent that's the transition it's a very angry transition and i think if you put a lot of drag then Oh yeah, that's really that's crossfading it a lot as well. So yeah, jiggle actually. <laughs> I don't use jiggle that often. Every time we do, it does add. A, I usually add it as like this final post effect. But in the same way that delay, we could do that smooth. We can do that as a post effect with almost no stiffness or even with a lot of stiffness. But if you do a lot of drag, it just means it's draining energy out. So look how long it takes for this R to fade in. Like it takes a really long. One fifty five. One fifty five. Jeez, Louise. Uh, but yeah, look how long it takes for this R to slowly fade in because of all of that drag. So, you know, jiggle doesn't have to add jiggle. It can add point-based drag. And even, you know, all of the stiffness and structure and whatnot, like we could probably feed it these same vertex maps, which I don't know what effect that will have on anything, but let's try duplicating that in a few times just for some wackiness. Eh, not terribly different, but yeah, vertex maps inside of. Uh, whoa, let's see if it does that again. Oh yeah, okay. So by putting that same vertex map inside of this, you really feel that letter R suddenly pop in, like the R just bursts from the center point now. Boom. So yeah, I mean, anyway, it's just fun to play and tinker around. We could go forever playing around with that, but we have to end at some point. So let me check out the uh, the chat. Um, uh, let's see. Could we modify the cube cutting and make the blade actually heat up the cube, like if the cube was metal and the blade was a Star Wars lightsaber? Um, um, we could do it with proximals. It's because that mesh is constantly updating. We couldn't do it via the we couldn't make it editable because then it would be constantly generating a new a new mesh um you might be able to i didn't i've never thought about it but if you make it editable and you set it to alembic mm, no but alembic i wonder if you could transfer a vertex map to an alembic file that's been made editable that's just something i don't know uh i was trying to wrap up but that is a really good question so just as a split second thing i, I do want to do a test so the volume measure, I'm going to attempt to bake it out of the limbic, which shouldn't take too long. That cut is quick. Now, what's going to happen is that this alembic file here is, it's a completely new mesh every frame, but is, see, you can't select points on it. And I kind of doubt we can put a vertex map on it. Let's find out. Um, you never know with this type of thing. Let's make a cube editable point mode. Set vertex weight. OK, so that's a vertex map. Try and drag it onto here and see if it transfers over. It did put it there. It doesn't mean it's going to work. Um, so now there's a vertex map. If we enable fields, and I'm going to feed in the bulge as just a simple radius significant size we can actually see it and we don't see it there but if we put a simple cinema material on it oh those are probably keyframes aren't they i'll just hide them um could this see the normal map it seems highly unlikely but i was willing to give it a go Effects, vertex map, vertex map. I wouldn't be surprised if this crashed either. Um, so that saw blade should be in that vicinity. Hit render. Um, it is not showing up. Also, the saw blade renders. I don't see it getting represented there. If we make this editable, does it keep its vertex map? Does it still animate? No. Okay, too bad. Yeah, that didn't work. 
at all. You could do it with, because we are using a spline, there is a pretty clean opportunity we get on this shape to possibly do a, a, a proximal thing. The, um, it looks like I broke it somehow. How did I break it? The saw blade doesn't have the bulge in it right now, but why not? I'm gonna revert, I'll revert to saved. Oh my goodness, it looks like I hadn't saved it in a while? That sucks. Oh man, yeah, we moved on without me saving the newest version of that, so I just reverted. Oh, it's funny because I compensated for that earlier. Yeah, this is before we did any of those uh, volume things. Dang it, well that sucks. Uh, oh, if we, unfortunately, if, they, if we hadn't had tackled this as a question, when I went to go close the files, I would have seen it not be updated and I would have saved it properly and now I've, I've lost that file. Um, unfortunate, yeah, there's not even a volume in here. Dang, that's a sucky way to end, but I'm not gonna rebuild all that right now. Um, but yeah, you can always do a proximal. You can always do a proximal after the fact, like it's just a, a set thing. And we can still see the proximal even on this given shape if we make a new material. And inside it, we'll just do the luminance channel. Feed it a do do do. Proximal. Oh yeah. Where is proximal height these days? There it is. Good old proximal. Um, I think we need to do it with a spline, although I'm not a hundred percent sure. If I feed it in this end side, I say I want it to see a vertices and hit render. Yeah, you see I get this circle um, and that circle should not. Yeah, you see this the entire it's the entire way along. And if we set the end distance to something like 22, that should be a lot smaller. But there's so many subdivisions on that. That should be like another and another and another and another. Um, so if we crank that up, it's currently linear, but you could make that any radius you want. So let's go to 55, set that to smooth. I like smooth there. So it should be nice and, come on render. Uh, you see, we get that transition. So that becomes, we could put the color channel back on, make it kind of dark. And then in the luminance channel, if we wanted that to be heating up, put that into a colorizer and load in a fiery preset. And yeah, now we get that red glow, hit render, and you see that is actually centered where that was. So a proximal would force it through, uh, even on even on the volume. So you know, that'd be a kind of a cool detail to put on top of it. For sure. Like I like the idea of it heating up. Uh, when it finished cutting, you'd probably want it to stop before it fell over. Otherwise, you'd also have to feed it more splines um, that wouldn't fall with it as it faded. So something to keep in mind there. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, dim I don't like autosave um, autosave messes me up more often than it helps me so this is the first time we've lost a file I think in three seasons so I'm, I'm going to say my way is fine for the way I work um, let's see uh, void sorry uh, we are now already over time but save the question for next week and we'll definitely take a look uh, Tobias thanks for the link um, everybody you can go and join the rocket lasso slack channel if you want so Tobias just put a link in there I'll put the link here in YouTube you can head on over there and you can join the community to help answer questions ask questions just participate you'll get you can join the live channel where I at the entire channel so you get notifications when I go live uh, all that stuff um is fun let's check out oh i remember the last thing i was going to do because the rubber or the rubber duck the walking duck finished so if i can let me properly clean this up so that oh we did a half res one i'm gonna pull over premiere and make sure there's no spoilers yeah okay so i've already got a file i was uh putting some Sequence, actually, let me import it. I'm gonna import it uh, on the other window. Yeah, cause it, oh, it's popping open the plugin we're working on. Um, renders, duck, frame one, image sequence, duck, boink. Okay, so now we're in Premiere. 
Here's some length. And let's just check it out. Boom. Boom. Definitely needs to be faster. Let's just speed it up already. Speed and duration. We'll just go full double speed. Oh, that's better already. If we if we had successfully shrunk it down, then the uh, that would have worked fine as well. I like he's not on a rail. He doesn't fall off. But you see, he is he is drifting dangerously close to the edge. Oh, he's twisting. Yeah, if there was more, if there was more frames or a longer ramp, there's a good chance that that would just eventually spin its way off. But you know what? Considering we just built it mechanically, and even that, we didn't uh, even really fake it on this. Like we, it is actually that body of the duck. As long as we get that proper pivot point, the proper angle of the ramp, it's just automatically doing that. There's all that stored energy. You know, you get that potential energy at the top of the ramp, and it's funny you don't really think of things that way. It's like, oh, something at the top of a, you know, something on a table. Well, that that is that object has potential energy, and we now see that energy slowly released, and we because of all the motion, you really feel like, oh, it's doing work, but it's the same as it just falling off. Ba -bum. Ba -bum. <laughs> I do really like that. So yeah, fun project. Thanks for that question. I love the real life stuff, real life questions that pop in, make it so we can tackle some really interesting things that we wouldn't normally think about in those ways and uh, making it fully dynamic. Obviously we could have done a looping animation and made it just work that way, but we, we made it dynamic. If we wanted to, we could make a whole army of those all like marching down. Uh, that's definitely something to, uh, to do as a goof, but that should wrap everything up. Uh, if you like the stuff, if you like these live streams, I gotta get back to tutorials as soon as all the plugins that we've had piled up get out. I can get back to ranking regular plugins. I've got, I did start working on a uh, tips and tricks video, which I always like making those, but they take a lot of effort, but I did start compiling one of those. Um, oh, if you like this work and you want to support it, there, there's two ways to support it. We've got Patreon set up. As I was saving all those scene files, you'd get access to all of those. You'd get access to the bonus streams, which happen most Tuesdays and Thursdays. And in addition to that, um, you get discounts on all the plugins, but the best way to support, of course, is to buy a plugin. If you buy a plugin from Rocket Lasso, then you're getting a tool that helps you with your job, and you are supporting us by using something we made. So I'll probably play I'll play the Mesh the Spawn commercial at the end, but that's going to wrap this up. Thank you so much, everybody. I'll see you in a week for another regular live stream, and I got to start getting some guests lined up as we reach the end of the season, but that should do it. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye.